Was he going to do a lecture in my place? <laughs> Sorry about the delay, this happens at least once a year. Central London suddenly becomes a complete car park. It took me, yep, one hour, 40 minutes to drive three miles, three and a half miles. That's the kind of thing that happens in this place. And I'm surprised I'm sane sometimes. You drive around and they drive like lunatics in the center. <coughs> Everybody's in a rush to get where they want to get to, so. Right, let's get a move on on all of this. I think I said we would get on to, oh God, talk about um, United States securities regulation today because I think we went through the necessary sections of EU regulation. And um, I think what we need to do now is to get through the US stuff, which is, um, as a preface, is quite complicated and it's very detailed. Um, fortunately, you don't have to actually un need to understand United States securities laws. Anybody who's done a course on US securities laws? Nobody? You're lucky. Um, it is probably one of the most complicated areas to get into. There's at least six volumes of regulation, but don't worry, we have nothing to do with it. And I'm going to start this by making the statement which I think is important to understand. We're not going to go through any particular aspects of US securities regulation um, other than those regulations which enable the global markets to operate um, without complying with U.S. securities regulation. When I start with it, I think you probably understand where we are going. It's about how we do not comply with United States securities laws, all six volumes of it. The reason is that the global markets um, when they started, um, were not looked upon by the U.S. securities regulators with any um, favor, and therefore they had to obtain political exceptions to operate in the global markets. At that time, it was smaller than the U.S. domestic markets 30 odd years ago, and today it dwarfs the global U.S. markets. Sorry, the global markets dwarf the U.S. markets. And therefore, the entire global markets operates on the basis of a number of exceptions, exemptions carved out and used to construct what we now have as the structure of an international bond issue. So fortunately for you, no, you don't have to worry about the details of U.S. securities regulation. That's not for us. What we're going to look at is what are the exemptions, what are the exceptions, and how have the markets carved out an area, a safe harbor in which the markets can operate without falling foul of or breaching United States securities laws. But make no mistake, they are regarded as being applicable globally. It's not a matter of saying it's US securities laws, but these are laws which the markets regard as being applicable globally. <laughs> 
and are recognized as such. The regulations that we are being concerned with are in fact enforced by the world's most powerful securities regulator, the SEC. It's got about 4,000 employees, including vast armies of lawyers who operate these regulations globally, not just in the US. If you just want a comparison, our EU regulator, ESMA, has just over 400 to operate the EU securities laws. You can see the comparison between the US regulatory system and ours. Now, having that, with that introduction, I want to get to the next point, which is that the structure of an international bond issue, a global bond issue, is actually based on the way that we have managed to operate within the framework of US securities laws. It's fundamentally important to understand that. So much so that international bond issues are done, are effected in a two-tranche structure. Thus far, we've been talking about an international bond issue. But when you look at the detail, it's in fact there are two issues which happen at the same time on every occasion. It's a two-tranche issue. And the two-tranche structure is dictated by the needs and the requirements of United States securities laws. So much so that the two tranches are referred to in the global markets by lawyers and investment bankers by the names of the two central U.S. regulations under which we operate. Regulation S and Rule 144A, which we'll go through in detail. And so you have, in every international bond issue, a Regulation S tranche and a Rule 144A tranche. That sets the scene. The entire structure of issue is driven by and controlled by United States securities laws. The second aspect, which is also something that you've seen in the structure of an international bond issue, is the issue of a temporary global bond before either a permanent global bond is issued or definitives are issued by an issuer. Now, I try and slot that into the, your framework of understanding the market, that you, the processes that you've come across. Why is that the case? Because, once again, United States securities laws require, in certain circumstances, not in all cases, in certain circumstances, that when the bonds have been issued on closing date, that the bonds cannot be represented by a permanent global bond if it's dematerialized or with definitives if the bond issue is done on an immobilized basis. It's got to be represented by a, what is called a temporary global bond, a TGB, for a period of 40 days. That's a, that's a given because of United States securities laws. At the end of the 40-day period, you will recall that the temporary global bond is exchanged either for a permanent global bond or definitives in the rare cases that definitives are issued. So the basic structure, therefore, is of a modern bond issue is driven by, oh, sorry, nothing happened here. Sorry? The only thing I work. I got into a bigger mess. Okay, wait a minute. I'll try something else. Yay. Gotcha. So, what we're going to get to is to try and work out what laws, what regulations get us to the point that we've got to. The work has been done by the lawyers in the markets. There's nothing that you need to understand other than where have we got to on the basis of what regulations. So let's try and understand where we've got to on this. Have you got a question? You look very puzzled. No, you're all right. There are at least three major statutes that we need to deal with or work with. All of them were enacted 
in the era after the great crash, not the 2008 crash, but the one that happened in the late 1920s and early 1930s. The Securities Act of 33, the Securities Exchange Act of 34, and the Trust Indenture Act of 39, which I think you've already probably you've come across. So those are the three statutes which we are concerned with. But again, not every provision in those statutes is relevant to us. But what is important is the fundamental approach of the U.S. courts and the U.S. regulators to the applicability of these laws across the globe. And because they regard it as applicable across the globe, we need to start looking at, well, what do we need to comply with? What is it we can not comply with? And so on. The most important provision, which is the counterpart of what we've been looking at in the EU, the requirement that you cannot offer securities to the public without a prospectus complying with the EU prospectus regulation. That rule is identical with the rule that you have in the U.S. Securities Act 1933. You cannot issue securities unless you have a complying registration statement. And that requirement, if you remember, in the EU, is triggered when an offer is made to the public in the EU. In the U.S., it's triggered where the offer of securities uses, and here's the key phrase, the means or instruments of transportation or communication in interstate commerce or the U.S. mails. Translated into 2019 language, it means even an email will trigger it. Use of the means or instruments of transportation or, look at that word, communication in interstate commerce or the U.S. mails. But the reality, oddly enough, is that no international bond issue actually complies with the Section 5 requirement that a registration statement must be filed in compliance with the requirements of the Securities and Exchange Commission's regulations. It's never done. No international bond issue, no convertible, no MTN or GDR complies with it. Markets have worked out a method of operating within certain exceptions which are framed and to be found in the U.S. statutes. Some of them were not even framed when the global markets um, came into existence, but they have been used to create this exception and a safe harbor to operate within um, the parameters of United States securities laws. You'll find that U.S. registration requirements in the form of a Section 5 complying, prospect, complying registration statement is filed as a matter of practice when a share issue is being done. Because in terms of a share market, the U.S. global market is fundamental to any success of a global share issue. Result, a registration statement complying with United States securities laws is used. But in a bond issue, that is not the case. You don't need to access the general U.S. market in order to make an international bond issue a success. You need some part of that market, but not all of it. And some part means the wholesale professional market. So the way that this, the modern structure works is that you will have two tranches which access the international markets and on the other side, the U.S. markets, complying therefore with the requirements of the U.S. 1933 Section 5 requirement. That's not all there is in United States securities laws. There is a number of others which we'll come across as we go along. One is Regulation M of 1996, framed under the Securities Exchange Act. It regulates stabilization. Just to cross-check, what law controls stabilization as far as the EU is concerned? Connect, cross-check, because this is going to happen all the time. What law controls stabilization in the EU? Sorry, anybody? 
Correct. The market cap is regulation. These two interface. We'll come to that later. The market abuse regulation applies extraterritorially, i.e. outside the EU, and the US regulation M applies extraterritorially. So if you're doing stabilization of an international bond issue in London, Frankfurt, Zurich, Singapore, Hong Kong, wherever it is, you've got two sets of regulations which hit you. Let's keep remembering this as we move along because you can't actually approach this without appreciating the interface between these two sets of global laws. In addition, <clears throat> there is the Trust in Denchak 1939, which has to be complied with. Now, you know as well as I do, international bond issues do not comply with the requirements of the Trust in Denchak 1939, even where, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> even where a trust deed is used and a trustee is appointed for an international bond issue in the minority of issues, that trustee and that trust deed do not comply with the requirements of the Trust in Dench Act 1939 of the US. Why? Because once again, the exceptions that we worked on, we worked with, to come outside the parameters of US regulation enable us to operate without complying with the Trust in Dench Act of 1939. So important point, if you can disapply Section 5 requirements of the Securities Act 1933, those same provisions will disapply the applicability of the Trust in Dench Act of 1939. On top of that are a series of what are called anti-fraud provisions in the US statute law, very similar to what we've got in the EU under the market abuse regulation. I'm not going to go through all that because we're not concerned with people committing fraud in the global markets. They can't because if they do, they don't have an, a job next year. But the anti-fraud provisions are important, remember. Section 12 and 17A of the Securities Act 1933, which deals with fraud, misleading statements, and so on. And don't forget, conduct giving rise to a false impression. Remember, MR, market abuse regulation, that language, it's found again in the Securities Act 1933. Then there's Section 10 of the Securities Act, Exchange Act 34, and a very, very important rule framed by the SEC under that 34 Act, Rule 10b-5 of the Securities and Exchange Commission, which deals with misleading statements and conduct. Again, conduct and statements. We'll come to that one in far more detail at a later point in time because that is important in terms of whatever you do, wherever on the globe. So that's the basic set of Statutes, nothing to do with the details, just the statutes that we're going to be dealing with. Now, what happens if you breach them? Just to get a feel for it, I don't think you need to go into detail on this because you're not going to be a criminal lawyer. You're going to be a securities lawyer or a bond, bond market lawyer. But it is good to know what these are. You breach any of those statutory rules or regulations, you first of all, it's a criminal offense and a cr violation of criminal provisions under Section 24 of the Securities Act 33. All contracts which breach these regulations are void. But far more importantly to the markets, two other things are out there. It's not the criminal sanctions, it's not the contracts going void, it's SEC fines. Securities and Exchange Commission fines, as you probably, if you bother to read the newspapers or read Twitter, I don't know, they, on Twitter, runs into billions of dollars, not hundreds of millions. So it's disastrous when those fines are put in place against an investment bank or an issuer. And perhaps even more importantly, SEC injunctions under Section 20 of the Securities Act 1933. If any bit of securities laws in the U.S. is violated or is about to be violated, the SEC has the power to obtain an injunction from a New York court to stop whatever the issue is that's going on. Yes, it could be Singapore, in Hong Kong, in Paris, in London, in Tokyo. Doesn't matter. There's an SEC injunction which can be issued. And you might say, well, what? Why would anybody comply with an SEC injunction? How would they enforce it against anybody? Well, the straight answer is simple. Every investment bank, every major global bank 
has an office in New York alongside London. You want to control the markets, you control New York and London. And the SEC controls New York under its SEC injunction power, Section 20. So no bank, no investment bank which is going to be involved in a bond issue wants to be hit with an SEC injunction because the SEC could issue that injunction in New York to stop an issue occurring in Tokyo or Shanghai or London, doesn't matter where. So that's a, it's a very powerful tool and the SEC will use it if the need arises. Right, the next thing you need to understand is the extraterritoriality of United States securities laws. Although framed in the context of the domestic markets, and the language itself doesn't actually say, it, well, this applies extraterritorially the way that EU regulations do, but the United States courts have repeatedly held that US securities laws are applicable globally, extraterritorially. And certainly the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, regards all of these rules as being applicable and must be complied with globally. There are, however, two restrictive principles that the courts have developed to limit the, the global applicability of all United States securities laws. I should say there are three, but the, the third one is a variation of the first two. One is known as the effects doctrine, which was articulated in a leading case of Schoonbaum and Firstbrook, and later in a case involving Bresch, Bresch and Drexel Firestone in 1975. What that case basically says, and don't bother reading it, um, what that case basically says is that United States securities laws will not be applied and cannot be applied globally to a transaction occurring outside the US unless there are effects from that transaction which are felt in the US effects have an impact in the US. That's the Schoonbaum doctrine of restriction. So whatever is happening out there, if it doesn't affect the US markets or the United States itself, then United States securities laws will not be applied extraterritorially. The second one is the conduct doctrine articulated in the ruling in ITT and Vencap, also in 75. The Vencap ruling said that in addition to cases where there are no effects in the US, but if the, uh, there is reasonable conduct within the US in relation to a transaction, then United States securities laws will be applied extraterritorially even if the vast majority of activity in relation to that transaction is outside the US. Conduct within the US. The court said reasonable amount. Goodness only knows what that means. You're not about to go and find that, find out how much is how good enough. And that means you do not go and draft your offering circular sitting at the Waldorf Astoria in New York. No, because you can get into an argument about is that sufficient conduct, but nobody wants to find that out. So answer, no conduct within the U.S which could be regarded as conduct occurring within the U.S. in relation to a transaction. Otherwise, it would trigger the entirety of United States U.S. securities laws. The third doctrine, articulated in 2010, Morrison and the National Australia Bank, there the court said that really United States securities laws should not be applied unless the transaction, quote, unquote, constituted a U.S. transaction. And what constitutes an U.S. transaction was where activity occurred in relation to a transaction on a U.S. exchange. So you've got three doctrines which seek in some way to restrict the applicability extraterritorially of United States securities laws. But you're going to be a capital markets lawyer, not a criminal lawyer. And therefore, you're not going to explore, and I'm not going to explore, the details of these three rules as to when you'll be breaching them. What we want to know is, how do we do this transaction? 
without breaching any of the U.S. securities laws. So yes, we do remember the effects doctrine. Yes, we do remember the conduct doctrine. Yes, we do remember the U.S. transactions doctrine as restricting or limiting the potential extraterritorial application of United States securities laws, but we're not about to go into court and find that out. It's too late. Our transaction is finished. So what you have to do, therefore, is to ensure that your transaction does not breach any of that United States securities laws that are applied extraterritorially. The more recent um, regulation, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act of 2010, also confers extraterritorial powers to interfere in transactions on the Securities and Exchange Commission, once again, in respect of conduct occurring outside the U.S., but which has a substantial and foreseeable effect in the U.S. That's rule one, the effects doctrine reiterated in the Dodd-Frank Act. And secondly, if there is conduct within the U.S. which involves violation of United States securities laws in respect of a foreign transaction. Once again, this is now the conduct-based doctrine. The two limbs are there once again in relation to conduct-based violations specified in the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act of 2010. I think with that background, sorry, did you have a question? Yeah. Could you, do you mind speaking up? Who decides? Ultimately, a U.S. court, but initially the Securities and Exchange Commission. The way the system works is the SEC simply steps in if it considers that U.S. securities laws are being breached, are about to be breached. If you want to contest that, you go into a U.S. court. And I think the way that the markets operate is, let's not try to find out. Because we're in the business of making money, not defending criminal cases in a U.S. court. So you want to make sure that what you do is completely clear of any of the minefields contained in United States securities laws. And it's not that difficult to do <coughs> because under political pressure, the SEC came up way back in 1990s, nearly 30 years now, with two operational safe harbors to enable international bond offerings or indeed international share offerings, convertibles offerings, to be effected without complying with and therefore involving any potential breach of U.S. securities laws. These are the two pillars on which the modern markets are built. First of all, it's Regulation S of 1990. And the next one is Rule 144A, also 1990, both enacted by the Securities and Exchange Commission. The fundamental divide that you need to remember. Regulation S, framed under the 1933 Act, seeks to provide parameters in relation to securities offerings which are essentially outside the U.S. Rule 144A deals with the, the scenario where the securities offering and the bonds or the convertibles are going to be sold into the U.S. So you want to sell anywhere across the globe, you comply with Regulation S. You want to sell into the U.S., you comply with Rule 144A, both enacted in 1990. And that's why I said International bond offerings now operate on the basis of a two-tranche structure. One tranche, the Regulation S tranche, sold globally outside the U.S. The Rule 144A tranche sold into the U.S. Each one has got its own parameters, its own requirements, its own specific conditions which need to be complied with. And this is where we have the modern two-tranche structure of the international bond issue. So let's look at one, Regulation S Safe Harbor. What do we have to do to ensure that there is no breach of U.S. securities laws, well, other than fraud and misconduct and all that, <coughs> in relation to a securities offering, a bond offering, a convertibles offering, 
which is occurring outside the territorial jurisdiction of the U.S. Now, there are, in fact, to be absolutely technical about this, Regulation S actually has two safe harbors. One is the issuer safe harbor, and the second is a resale safe harbor. It is the issuer, <coughs> excuse me, it's the issuer safe harbor, which is fundamentally important to the global markets because it sets out the parameters that you must comply with for any international bond offering in relation to securities sold outside the US. But repeat, it does not permit sales into the US. Compliance with the conditions of Regulation S does not enable an issuer or its investment banks to sell securities into the US. That can happen only under Rule 144A. So to get into this issue of safe harbor, what do we have to do? Number of conditions need to be complied with. First of all, all international bond issues need to comply with two basic requirements. First, there is a prohibition on directed selling efforts. And secondly, there is a requirement that the transaction be an offshore transaction. Two basic primary requirements which must, in all cases, be complied with. Assuming those, I'll get to the details of those two requirements shortly. Assuming those two requirements can be complied with and indeed are complied with, additional conditions are applicable. Depending on the category of the issuer doing the international bond issue, the convertible issue, the MTN issue, or whatever. There are three categories of issuers that are dealt with, and we'll look at them in detail. First of all, is a category called foreign issuers with no substantial U.S. market interest in their securities. SASMI, no SASMI, substantial U.S. market interest. If you fall within, if the issuer falls within that category, foreign issuer with no U.S. market interest in its securities, then <coughs> No further conditions are applicable. All you need to do is to comply with the two primary requirements and you're done. If, however, there is any question about whether there is U.S. market interest in the issuer's securities, then you can fall back into the second category, Rule 903C2, which is non-reporting foreign issuers, non-reporting, reporting to whom, reporting to the SEC. Foreign issuers of debt securities. Now, the moment I say that, you'll see that nearly every issuer in the market will fall within that second category. It's great if you can fall within category one, but if you can't, you fall within category two, and there you can then start complying with two further conditions, which I'll come to shortly. All other issuers other than the second category fall into category three issuers, which I'll come to again shortly. But let's go back to our two primary requirements. The prohibition on directed selling efforts and the requirement that every transaction must be an offshore transaction. Now, what do you mean by no directed selling efforts? Well, it's not defined in the, in the regulation itself, but the Securities and Exchange Commission have said this is what we regard as no directed selling efforts. Move away from that and we hit you with an injunction. And what they've said, <coughs> excuse me, is as follows. <coughs> First of all, the old fashioned stuff. You can't mail offering materials in hard copy to anybody in the US, to investors in the US. You cannot have roadshow seminars. You know what those roadshows are, you remember? No, you've completely forgotten. They're not rodeos. Road shows? No, it's not Formula One shows either. They're investment banks, meeting groups of investors, telling them how good the bond issue is going to be and how about buying some. That's a road show. It's done physically, face to face. And perhaps in um, meetings which have been pre-organized. Again, can't do it. 
in the U.S. No radio or television ads in the U.S. You can see when this, this um, guidance release was given. It was when there were people who were using radio and television. But finally, no screen quotations in relation to the securities being offered to be made anywhere in the U.S. That makes it a little bit more difficult because a how do you control a screen ad, an electronic screen ad? What the no directed selling efforts says is, well, you can't have screen quotes in the U.S. Well, you can put one up here, but it can be seen in the U.S. So you have that problem, which, again, the SEC in 1998 said, okay, what you have to do is as follows. If you set up a website concerning the bond issue, then you need to ensure that the website does not have unrestricted access. And access must be controlled by <coughs> a couple of things. First of all, the website must contain a disclaimer, a formal disclaimer, that the securities offering does not target U.S. investors and that persons classified as quote unquote U.S. person, who are they? I'll come to that later. U.S. persons may not participate in the offering. Secondly, that or anyone purchasing securities in this offering must identify their country of residence as being outside the U.S. with a postal address and telephone number. Um, and each person buying or offering to buy securities in the offering must actually state that it confirms non-U.S. residents and that it is a non-U.S. person as defined. So that's what you need to do in a modern context if you're doing a website in order to market the securities that you're offering under Regulation S. What was the point of the regulation? How did they clarify what they do every single state, or is it just one like a company? We haven't reached Tier 1 yet. Have we? We're at issue stage issue stage. There's not even tier one. You guys have really got bogged down in this tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. I notice it at the seminars as well. You're running around with bundles of right when, rights when in fact the terms and conditions of the bond instrument is actually in the bond itself. Anyway, let's come back to that at seminars. Come back to what we're talking about. Now, there's an important qualification in relation to internet or website communications or advertisements. You're required to comply with these three items which we've just talked about. But importantly, this is your Regulation S offering. Consequently, if there is a Rule 144A offering being made at the same time, the SEC requires that no reference whatsoever is made to the Rule 144A offering in the Regulation S website. In other words, these, complying with these requirements is okay, gets you to a safe harbor, if, if there's only one tranche, a Regulation S tranche, but in practice there's always a second tranche the Rule 144A tranche aimed at U.S. investors. If so, the SEC requirement is that the Regulation S website, in addition to complying with all of this, cannot refer to the existence of a Rule 144A offering. Now, what about other types of advertising? in relation to the issue. Well, Rule 138 and Rule 139 permits U.S. securities dealers and brokers participating in a Regulation S offering 
to actually publish their ordinary research, ordinary research reports in relation to an issue without using that as a means of marketing this particular issue. You're lost, so I'll explain it again. Supposing you've got a fiat issue, dollar-denominated issue, under Regulation S. There are brokers from Namura to Goldman Sachs to Deutsche Bank who will be publishing reports about fiat. That's normal commercial practice if you read a newspaper or look at Tinder, I suspect. But it, it, it's a normal practice in the markets that investment banks, dealers publish reports about major corporate entities. Now, what this rule does is to enable U.S. securities dealers and brokers to continue publishing such reports without breaching Regulation S. But the report must be filed in the ordinary course of business, must be disseminated in the ordinary course of business, and should not specifically discuss the particular securities issue which is on offer under Regulation S. In other words, a general report of, wow, how good is Fiat, it's doing fantastically, it makes these wonderful cars, blah, 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 is fine. Now remember, but this exception applies only to U.S. securities dealers and brokers. If a foreign securities broker or dealer disseminate any such similar report, it will breach Rule 15A6 of the Securities Exchange Act and become subject to <coughs> penalties or require SEC registration immediately. So that deals with just one type of dissemination of information about an issuer in the context of a Regulation S offering. <coughs> Otherwise, the usual rule is that one, this one here. Excuse me. <coughs> the second requirement in a Regulation S offering is that it must be an offshore transaction. The SEC has said that means that the issue and the investment banks must ensure that all buy orders in relation to that bond issue must emanate from outside the U.S. No offer to buy securities in relation to that bond offering can come from within the United States. All offers to buy must come from outside. Those two requirements are not too difficult to comply with, I would have thought. The next question is, what else applies? What else do you need to comply with? As I said earlier, it depends on the type of category of issuer. Three issuers, three types of issuers, three categories of issuers. Foreign issuers with no substantial U.S. market interest in, in their securities, and all sovereign issuers come within that bracket, come within that category, i.e., no further conditions need to be complied with. That's in Rule 902B1. The second category, as I said, which would apply to most issuers in the international bond markets is the exception for issuers of debt securities in Category 2. And then the third category are equity issuers of equity securities, non-reporting foreign issuers with substantial U.S. market interest. But let's go back to 2 now, which is really where most of the issuers in the international bond markets will fall. What do they need to do? But hang on, sorry, I forgot. Before I got on to issuers of debt securities, I need to tell you who are these people, foreign issuers with no substantial U.S. market interest in their securities, because if you can fall within that bracket into that category, no further conditions other than the two primary requirements apply to you. So who are they? Who are foreign issuers with no SASME? A foreign issuer is defined to include, one, a foreign government, so that means they need to comply only with the two primary requirements. And all corporate entities incorporated outside the U.S., all corporate entities incorporated outside the U.S., provided that more than 50% of the voting stock of that corporate entity is held by overseas persons. Now, you can see why that exception is there. 
because otherwise every U.S. corporation will incorporate a subsidiary in the Cayman Islands and can issue bonds without any difficulty, without complying with U.S. securities laws. You can't, because we are more than 50 percent of voting stock is held by U.S. persons, your court. You need to show that 50 percent of voting stock is actually held by overseas persons. But even if that is the case, you're not a foreign issuer with no substantial U.S. market interest if the majority of executive officers or directors are U.S. citizens or U.S. residents, or more than 50 percent of the assets of the issuer are located in the U.S., or the actual business of the issuer is managed from the U.S. So the foreign issuer exception is hedged in very carefully to prevent abuse by U.S. corporations. So even if 50 percent of the voting share capital is held by entities outside the U.S., you'd still get caught if you fall within any of these three negative criteria. So if your assets, 50 percent of assets are found in the U.S., you're caught. You cannot be treated as a foreign issuer. Or your business is managed from the U.S., you're no longer a foreign issuer. So you need to be careful about that. Next question is, what exactly do we mean by substantial U.S. market interest in the securities of the issuer? Now, we're not talking about the securities which are being issued. We are talking about securities which are currently in issue and outstanding. And Regulation S specifies two tests, a test for outstanding debt securities and another one for equity securities. Just to confuse the matter, convertible bonds, which we will come to hopefully um, either next week or, or, or after the midterm break, convertible bonds need to satisfy both the debt securities test and the equity test. Now, for debt securities, there are three alternative tests which decide whether or not this issuer has substantial U.S. market interest in its securities. First of all, if <coughs> debt securities of the issuer are held by 300 or more persons who are classified as U.S. persons as defined, then that entity is not a foreign issuer with no substantial U.S. market interest. It does not qualify. Or if US $1 billion of its debt securities are held by U.S. persons, again, it will not be treated as a foreign issuer with no SASME. Thirdly, if 20 percent of its debt securities, regardless of the amount, are held by U.S. persons, if the answer is yes to any one of those three criteria, then you cannot qualify as a foreign issuer with no substantial U.S. market interest in your securities. Debt is also defined to include not just international bonds and debt securities, but also non-participating preferred stock, i.e. non-voting, and asset-backed securities, i.e. those issued in the context of securitizations. The equity test, <clears throat> which we need to look at simply because it applies to convertible bonds and bonds with warrants, which we'll come to shortly, or which you hopefully are aware of. The test is that you've got to ask whether the exchanges in the U.S., the New York Stock Exchange and other similar exchanges, or automated quote systems like NASDAQ. Never heard of NASDAQ. I mentioned it many times before, but I'll repeat it again since you copy, 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 and then forget all about it. National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quote System, NASDAQ. If either a U.S. exchange or NASDAQ constitutes the largest single market for its equity securities, then that issue is regarded as one which, for which there is substantial U.S. market interest in its securities. There is SASME. Alternatively, 
is 20% or more of all trading in its stock, equity stock, takes place in the US, 20%, and less than 55% of trading in that issuer's stock takes place in a single overseas market in the previous year. Do you see how appallingly difficult it is to work out whether you fall within, you as an issuer, fall within these categories or not? Consequently, <coughs> Regulation S provides that even if you're not strictly within these parameters, you the issuer, but nevertheless you had a reasonable belief that you were within these parameters, that is sufficient. Not only for yourself, but also for the investment banks which are underwriting the issue which is quite an important exception because otherwise it becomes absolutely impossible to work out whether or not somebody falls within these criteria. Now, assume you're not a category one issuer, i.e. foreign issuer with no substantial US market interest in its securities. What happens? Yes, you've got to comply with the two basic conditions, namely no directed selling efforts, buy orders must come from abroad, but on top of that, you need to comply with two further conditions, which are referred to as transactional restrictions and offering restrictions. The transactional restrictions <clears throat> are referred to in market practice by investment banks as a soft lockup. What does a soft lockup mean? It means that no resales of the securities offered under Regulation S can be made to U.S. persons, as defined, within 40 days of the closing date of the bonds. Within 40 days of the closing date of the bonds. Consequently, the 40-day the, the period is the period during which we say there is a soft lockup under U.S. securities laws in relation to Regulation S securities, because you, even if they are sold to non-U.S. persons, they cannot be resold to U.S. persons as defined for 40 days. Interestingly, if they are equity securities, this soft lockup lasts for one year. No resales into the U.S. for one entire year. Secondly, the notice of this restriction, no sales to U.S. persons for 40 days, must be given Notice must be given to any purchaser who purchases the securities in the Regulation S offering, saying you can't resell to U.S. persons as defined for 40 days. And that notice must be given under contractual obligations set out in the bond issue documentation, namely in the subscription agreement and the agreement between managers. So specific requirement. You remember there was a provision saying you will comply with all applicable United States securities laws? This is it. The requirement is that you will comply with the notice requirement, namely that each buyer will be given a notice by the underwriters and managers that any purchaser may not resell the regulation as securities to a U.S. person as defined for 40 days. And that's why we call it a soft lockup. So apart from the transactional restrictions which are referred to as a soft lockup, on top of that there are offering restrictions. The offering restrictions are actually things to be contained in contractual documentation. So, the subscription agreement and the agreement between managers must contain specific provision imposing a contractual obligation on all parties, issuer, underwriters, and anyone who's, who's signing the subscription agreement and the agreement between managers, that they will not make any sales to U.S. persons for 40 days from the date of the launch of the issue. <coughs> 
Secondly, the prospectus, the offering circular that's being used, and any marketing documents must carry a prominent statement, a legend in red, mostly. That's what happens in market practice, St which states literally on the cover of the prospectus. It will state, securities are not registered with the SEC and therefore cannot be sold in the U.S. or U.S. persons. That's a Regulation S requirement. So both documents, the prospectus on the one side, which will have this legend, this statement on the front cover, and then you'll have a contractual provision in the contractual documentation, namely the subscription agreement and the agreement between managers requiring no sales to U.S. persons as defined for 40 days. Those are the offering restrictions. But so far, we have not talked about Category 3 issuers. Remember, I'll take you back. Category 3 issuers there. We've talked about the foreign issuers with no substantial U.S. market interest. We've talked about the majority of issuers in the global markets, namely issuers of debt securities, who are caught by the two primary requirements plus the offering restrictions and the transaction restrictions. But if you can't fall within that, then you fall within Category 3 as a non-reporting foreign issuer with substantial U.S. market interest. In that scenario, <coughs> the, <coughs> the issuer gets subject to what we call <coughs> a hard lockup. What is a hard lockup? Answer, these are the cases where at the clo on the closing date of the bond issue, neither a permanent global bond nor definitives can be issued by the issuer to the clearance systems. All that can be issued under United States securities laws is a, a, a temporary global bond which will be valid for 40 days. At the end of the 40-day period, the clearance system is required to certify that all bonds held within their clearance systems are held for the account of non-U.S. persons as defined. It's when that certification can be given by the clearance systems, Clearstream or Euroclear, or DTC, that a permanent global bond or the definitives can be delivered to the clearance systems. During this hard lockup period, one more thing needs to be done. Namely, a notification must be sent to each purchaser. Everybody during that period, not just the first purchaser, everyone purchasing during that 40-day period must be given a notification that during that 40-day period, each purchaser, now it's tier 1, tier 2, tier 3, tier 4, tier 5, anybody, is subject to resale restrictions, prohibiting such purchaser from selling to U.S. persons as defined. Now you see by now that this really hard lockup shouldn't apply in many bond issues in the global markets because of you need an issuer could fall within category two. But in a small number of cases, yes, it can fall within category three. But that's not the reason why the hard lockup and the temporary global bond is complied with in practice. Now comes a complication. So far, we've been talking about US securities laws and what they require to be done in order for the international bond issue to comply with United States security laws. In addition, there is tax regulation in the US under the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act, TEFRA, T-E-F-R-A, Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act. And it has got TEFRA deregulation which I'm not going to go into detail on it, just to tell you this. 
the TEFRA deregulation, which says that if you as an issuer are subject to U.S. tax jurisdiction, that means many an issuer in the international bond markets will be subject to U.S. tax jurisdiction, then TEFRA D requires that such issuers comply with, guess what? Category 3 hard lockup requirements. Namely, temporary global bond to be issued at the on closing date, to be exchanged for definitives or permanent global bonds at the end of the 40 day period. That's really what brings in the hard lockup into the international bond market. More than securities laws, which don't really require it except for a small number of issuers, it's TEFRA D regulations, which require the hard lockup in relation to quite a large number of international bond issuers who would otherwise not need to comply with this regulation, with the hard lockup. Because it's brought in not by United States securities laws, but through United States tax laws, DEFRA deregulation. It's something to remember. <coughs> I've done a diagram in my book saying what controls what, regulation S and DEFRA D. So, if you want to get a diagrammatical form, it's in there if you want to look at it up. So that's what you need to comply with. Now we need to look at that very important phrase that we've been using over and over again. You can't sell to U.S. persons as defined. So who are they? Well, all U.S. corporates and all U.S. citizens and residents are classified as U.S. persons for purposes of Regulation S. But there is an extremely important exception. All branches, all officers, overseas officers and branches of all U.S. banks, all U.S. insurance companies are not to be regarded as U.S. persons for purposes of Regulation S. So if you can't sell to Bank of America in the U.S., you can sell to Bank of America, London, Singapore, or anywhere else. You can sell to U.S. insurance companies as long as it's a foreign office, which creates a huge gap in terms of what the global markets can do in terms of marketing an international bond offering to U.S. entities provided the U.S. entity is operating from an office outside the U.S. And that's an extremely important exemption, the non-U.S. person definition. Um, in addition to banks and insurance companies, there's another major group which um, is important. U.S. fund managers outside the U.S. managing accounts for non-U.S. persons. Now, remember, there are two requirements here. U.S. fund manager operating from an overseas office managing accounts for non-U.S. persons. So a fund manager... like the Soros funds, managing the pension funds of <clears throat> Japanese corporations can be accessed because they're not U.S. persons as defined, even though the Soros hedge fund is <coughs> located in the U.S. Equally, another major group of investors, supranational institutions, World Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the EIB, the Asian Development Bank, are not to be regarded as U.S. persons, even though their headquarters in most cases are to be found, at least not the EBRD, but the others in the U.S. All to be treated as non-U.S. persons, which again creates a major <coughs> area of entities to whom international bonds can be marketed and sold under Regulation S. I was going to finish this today, but I think I got late, so I'll try. The second tranche of bonds. Well, now we are talking about selling in. Yeah. I haven't got a clue. You know why? Something I've repeated over and over again. <clears throat> 
International bonds are not sold to individuals. Stop. Okay. Remember to whom they are sold on day one? Account holders in the clearance systems. There are no individuals with dual or triple or quadruple nationality sitting in the clearance systems. Right, let's come back. Rule 144A. This is a rule which permits sales of securities into the U.S. Very important. Regulation S enables securities offerings outside the U.S. to non-U.S. persons. R Rule 144A enables sales into the U.S. Securities which have not been registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission, i.e. non-complying securities which have not been registered under Section 5. How can you do it? Well, as long as you're selling, as long as the issuer and the investment banks are selling securities in the U.S. to a group called Qualified Institutional Buyers, QIBs, QIBs, essentially a group of professional and sophisticated investors, the requirement that there has to be a complying registration statement lodged and approved by the SEC does not apply. So to that extent, this is a very important exception because global securities are not targeted at your friendly farmer in Arkansas with or without dual nationality. The target is institutional investors, banks, insurance companies, pension funds, large corporations. And therefore, insofar as any such institution qualified qualifies as a qualified institutional buyer, QIB, you can sell the securities into the hands of such an entity. Now we've got to deal with a quirk in United States securities laws. It is a quirk. Rule 144A, although a safe harbor enabling sales into the U.S., is not a primary sale safe harbor. If you chat to your pals, you're going to be totally clueless when it comes to doing anything to do with this stuff. So try to concentrate. This is really complex stuff. The resale safe harbor is what 144A happens to be. It does not apply, it does not cover a first sale of securities. It only covers a second sale, a resale. That's why I said it's a quirk. Consequently, what you've got to do, what the investment banks and the issuers have got to do, is to be able to do a first sale without breaching United States securities laws and then a resale into the U.S. under Rule 144A, which is a resale safe harbor. So the question that lawyers in the markets had to grapple with for years was, how do we create a safe harbor for the first sale? It must, in other words, the Rule 144A sale into the hands of U.S. investors, the qualified institutional buyers, must be preceded by a primary sale which is not caught by Section 5 of the Securities Act requiring a complying registration statement. So how do you do it? Well, the obvious one that people thought about was, well, hang on, can't we do a Regulation S sale, primary sale, followed by a Rule 144A sale, because Regulation S provides a safe harbor. So you do the first sale under Regulation S, and then you resell into the U.S. under Rule 144A. <coughs> Excuse me. That doesn't work for one obvious reason. Why? Because Regulation S sales are caught by the rule that for 40 days, from closing date, securities may not be sold to U.S. persons. So to sell under Regulation S into the market and then sell back into the U.S. can only be done after the 40-day period, which from a marketing standpoint, from a commercial viewpoint, is a non-starter. Consequently, Regulation S is not the route that the market identified as 
the basis on which the first sale could be done. The other problem was that um, the regulation S rule 144A route is blocked because of regulation S requiring that no sales can be made to brokers and dealers in the U.S. under regulation S, which means that you, you, you've got to first sell out in, somewhere out into the non-U.S. market and then bring the securities back. And even that, you're caught by the 40-day prohibition of no sales to U.S. persons, so the whole thing doesn't really work. <coughs> the route which has found favor and is still used is the, the, a route whereby the first sale is done by way of a private placement under Section 4.2 of the Securities Act 1933. This is an offering which, uh, of sale of securities which does not, quote unquote, involve a public offering of securities. How do you know that you can do a sale of securities which does not involve a public offering? Answer, over the years, legal opinions from U.S. counsel, leading U.S. counsel, I should say, have developed a series of conditions which, if complied with, would enable global U.S. law firms to say, we can say that this does not involve a public offering and therefore constitutes a private placement under Section 4.2 of the Securities Act 1933. So, what, is the, what are the requirements? First of all, they've said, the notes that are being issued must be in large denominations. You can't do the regulation S $10,000 bond. It's got to be around $50,000 face value of the bond. Secondly, it needs to be restricted to a small number of potential purchases of security, a small number. How much? They'll say no more than 20. Three, offers must, can only be made to sophisticated investors in the form of financial institutions. And a non-distribution letter is signed by purchasers. In other words, that they will not engage in a public distribution of the securities, and they <coughs> agree that that will be their obligation. But such a private placement under Section 4.2 is caught by a one-year resale restriction under Section 4.2 itself. So you can sell under 4.2, as your primary sale, followed by a sale under Rule 144A, but that, that is subject to a one-year no-sale restriction, no resale restriction. Thus, what U.S. law firms have advised over the years is that you need to read Section 4.2 together with Rule 144A. Because the one-year resale restriction in Section 4.2 is lifted by the 144A rule, which says resale restrictions shall not be applicable, the one-year resale restriction. I mean, they could have drafted this a little bit clearer, but that's the way it is. Now, there is another provision which you will find being bandied about in the markets. Regulation D. Regulation D sets out the parameters under which a private placement under Section 4.2 can be done. It sets out very clearly the criteria that needs to be complied with in order for something to be a private placement. Namely, no general advertising. Purchases must not acquire the securities with a view to distribution. There are no more than 35 purchases of the securities. The purchaser must be a sophisticated investor. And they can only be re the securities sold under Regulation D can only be resold under another safe harbor and may not be sold to an underwriter. So why don't we use this one? Well, because, unfortunately, hang on, whoops, I just jumped again. The Regulation D safe harbor does not allow resales 
because the regulation D safe harbor creates what are called restricted securities which are subject to a no resale restriction and here's the gap in the US securities laws. Rule 144A does not lift the one year resale restriction in regulation D. It lifts it in relation to section 4.2 generally but not in relation to regulation D securities. I know this is just a bloody nightmare. We all knew that for the last 20 years. But that's really why, although many people say, oh, we can do a regulation D style private placement. Yes, it can be a regulation D style placement, but it is not a regulation D placement, because if it is, it's caught by a one year resale restriction, which is not lifted by rule 144A. And that's why we go back to the formula developed by U.S. law firm saying, you do this, you've got a private placement under Section 4.2, sale one. Sale two is under Rule 144A, and there is no restriction applicable at that point in time. If you give me five minutes, I think I might be able to get through this. Um, so anyway, that, those are the general requirements, no advertising, no television, no radio, and electronic roadshows are permissible only if the website has limited passwords, sorry, not limited, but limited by password to those entities called qualified institutional buyers. Um, okay, let me just try and finish off some of this stuff. I need to tell you something else. Who are these qualified institutional buyers? Well, the only people who can buy the resale securities which have been privately placed under Section 4.2 as a list, insurance companies own it, which own and invest 100 million US dollars, investment companies, investment advisors who own and invest 100 million minimum, securities dealers registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission who invest a minimum 100 million on a discretionary basis, and banks also investing at least 100 million on an ongoing basis with a net worth of US 25 million. It's a very, very, very broad category. Um, so those are the entities to whom one may sell Rule 144A securities, even though they are based in the US and are US persons. And here's the next quirk in the regulation. Um, there are a number of conditions applicable to the Rule 144A resale. The one year resale restriction contained in Section 4.2, in other words, you can't resale for one year. That's contained in Section 4.2, the private placement exemption. It's lifted under 144A, but with a qualification. Only if the resales ongoing are made to qualified institutional buyers. So sale one under the private placement exemption in section 4.2, second sale, nicely within rule 144A, complying with the criteria that we've talked about, but then you get caught with another one. 144A says, sure, that's all fine, you're within the exemption, but Resales are only covered from the first qualified institutional buyer, tier one QIBs, onwards, if the resales are also to qualified institutional buyers. So how does the market create that structure which ensures that every sale by one QIB is only to another QIB? Answer was very easily done. <coughs> the market set up through NASDAQ <coughs> the portal electronic trading system. To become a member of portal, you've got to be a qualified institutional buyer. And all sales of Rule 144A securities, therefore, can only be traded within the portal system. You want to buy a 144A security, you've got to be a qualified institutional buyer. Any resales, you've got to be a qualified institutional buyer. How do you do that answer? Every qualified institutional buyer who wants to participate 
becomes a member of the portal system. Problem solved. But do you see how complicated this whole damn structure is because of the way United States securities laws work? They have never really been put together in a comprehensive, structured way. It's been piecemeal, patchwork, from 1933 to date. And that's why you spend a lot of time working through these various nitpicky rules in order to arrive at the result where we are now. Now, final item. We've said so far there has to be a one sale, private placement, under Section 4.2, followed by a Rule 144A sale to qualified institutional buyers, followed by resales to more qualified institutional buyers within the portal system. Question one. So how does this fit back into our bond issue structure? Where is this sale one occurring? Well, the answer is very straightforward. The issuer agrees in a subscription agreement with a group of underwriters to sell to those underwriters sale one. Four two, section four two, private placement to Goldman Sachs, Nomura, whoever it is, who are the investment banks underwriting the issue. They will then do the second sale under Rule 144A into the hands of qualified institutional buyers. It is now as simple as that. This convoluted legal analysis is what we all went through trying to arrive at an acceptable legal analysis. But the, the consensus is that this is a legal analysis on the basis of which the markets work. And in practice, ask a junior lawyer, they all he, she, or other gender would not know why they're doing it this way. All they'll know is the underwriters...